Part number two, pagan decapitation discovered at dawn. Part number two, we're going to be looking at Yahuwah's benchmark, not man's. Yahuwah's benchmark, the first battle with the Philistines. And yes, it is Boker to Boker or dawn to dawn. And this is a bit of a review for us for Samuel 4.2. And the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was smitten by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. At the erroneous idea of bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the location of battle for victory and revenge, Hophni and Pinhas, without authorization, entered the Most Kodesh place and carried the Ark into the camp. A deceptive spirit had entered into Hophni and Pinhas of their own accord. Here is the second battle with the Philistines. Please note here on the upper left-hand corner, Boker design or dawn design number one. It starts with the dawn over here. This is Boker or dawn A. This is the light season of the second battle. Here's your 24 hours of, of uh, the cycle. And here's dawn, dawn to dawn. Please note where the sunset is down here. First Samuel 4.10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and every man fled to his tent. And the slaughter was very great, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. 1 Samuel 4, 17. And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people, and your two sons have died, Hophni and Pinhas. And? The Ark of Elohim has been captured. The Ark was taken. Hophni and Phinehas were slain. I want you to please note the covenant correct location of dawn and sunrise. Dawn, sunrise, and dawn. You'll see this in Jeremiah 33.20, covenant of the light and covenant of the night seasons. Both of them have covenants. Very important. So when we change to, or when man changes to sunset theory, are they destroying Yahuwah's covenant of the light and covenant of the night? Continuing on. Boker design, number 1B. The syncretism. Syncretism of placing the Ark beside Dagon. And the Philistines took the Ark of Elohim and brought it from Eben Hazer to Ashdod. And the Philistines took the Ark of Elohim and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. You can see a nice interesting picture here displayed of them bringing the Ark into the temple of this fish god, a no god to be honest. Yahuwah exposes pagan falsehood. At this point over here, this is the light season of the second battle, Dagon had been placed beside the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ashdodites rose early in the morning, interesting, that's dawn, and saw Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the Ark of Yahuwah. So they took Dagon and put it in its place again at dawn. This is when they saw Dagon destroyed. This is the second light season when Sunset Theory wants to indicate he was having a rest, a time of relaxation. But yet the scriptures, the Hebrew language declares that at this dawn is when Dagon was paying involuntary obeisance to Yahuwah by being face down on the ground at dawn. This is no rest for Dagon. Dagon on cycle number two was face down to the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. It was not a rest cycle. There was no reprieve given from Yahuwah. The Philistines arose and arrived at dawn. This is 
1 Samuel 5, 4. This is the next verse that gives a description of the events. And when they arose early, this is at the very beginning of an identified time frame, when they arose early on the morrow, that's the next day, when at dawn, that is Boker, at dawn, when they arose early on the morning, morrow morning, at dawn, this is where they saw Dagon one more time with a very serious problem this time. Note the forward progressive movement of all events. We're going to look at this again on the next slide. It is here that Yahuwah shatters the authority of paganism. And when they arose early on the morrow dawn or morning, we know that from the word boker, and saw Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the Ark of Yahuwah, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of its hands cut off on the threshold, only Dagon itself was left of it. Only Dagon itself was left of it. Paganism was dismembered, destroyed at this point, destroyed visually and physically. So what is carried over for today? What is our lesson? Dagon, again, was face down to the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. Is that going to happen one more time in the future? The syncretism of placing the ark beside Dagon, just to review here again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, there is your three points, mo early morrow morning to determine time, and saw Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of Yahuwah and the head of Dagon, and both of the palms of its hands cut off on the threshold, only Dagon itself was left of it. The head and palms on the threshold. Only Dagon itself was left of it. The head, that's the power and control center. The hands, that's the ability to art articulate, manipulate, and destroy. Placed on the threshold. That's the center of the gate. Christianity is directly represented by Dagon, and the placement of these body parts is profound. The power and ability of Christianity has been rejected and refused entry to proceed through the threshold. Cut off from entering through the gate into the city, the city of the heavenly Yerushalayim. Now, what about this term Christianity? I, I remember a time when Catholicism was not considered Christianity. But today, it is, it is pushed off, you know, slid aside as Christianity. And what about all the Protestant religions that are going back and paying allegiance to that Dagon-based religion. What about them? Are they under the umbrella of this Christianity that is represented by Dagon? What about that? Next directive from Yahuwah. This is a Bible trail. To date, there are over 40 witnesses in Scripture each showing with clarity that every day of the week begins with the eyelashes of dawn twilight. You can read about that in Job 3, 9. Many of the dawn day studies also hold the keys to other gems that would never have been found except for a deeper investigation within these special studies that were chosen by Yahuwah to be saved. Saved for who? For those other people that read the Bible? Or are they saved for us if we are paying attention? 
This Dawn Day study on Dagon has held the same surprise. Next, we will take a shorter or a short detour to expose the gem in this study to investigate the word threshold for Dagon. How many thresholds does Dagon have? We're going to investigate the word threshold for priesthood. That would be the Melchizedek priesthood with a lead from the name of Yosef. What does Yosef have to do with the Melchizedek priesthood? Anything? Does scripture have something to reveal about Yosef? This information will only be a seed towards the larger priesthood study of Melchizedek. Note that little sprout on the right. What happens when that little sprout turns into a sunflower and it grows in the heat and you have this massive, big, beautiful flower? Well, this is where the priesthood study is going to be going. Yosef is a seed. Time to consider Dagon's threshold. What is Dagon's threshold? Or are there a few of them? Threshold, H4670, Mifton, from the same as 6620. Note that that definition is a sill. What is a sill? Is that, that not by a window, a window sill? Is that an opening to the house, depending on what house it's at? KGV has it as threshold. What about 6620? Pethon. From an unused root meaning to twist. An asp. From its contortions. KGV uses, as, uses this word as adder. Very serious implications here. A twist of an adder. Is not adder... Isn't that represent death? What about this threshold of Dagon? What is the meaning of Dagon's thresholds? Is the Hebrew definition representing the twisted threshold of pagan no gods? Was not Dagon blocked? from leaving his threshold? What about this earth threshold? Will Dagon leave it? Has anyone noticed that this Dagon-based belief structure in nominal Christianity today appears so close, even at the threshold of righteousness, having the form of, the picture of, a hint of the righteous doctrine of salvation, although very twisted, but it is heaven, heavily enveloped in syncretism. Can I stress heavily enveloped enough? We must remember that this is the mother harlot to which the daughters will return when they step over the harlot's threshold into the door of the temple of Dagon. Cut off at the threshold? Why cut off? And cut off before who? It might not be who you think, depending on your view. Dagon, which his name comes and, or na his name goes to Dragon, and we'll see that in future here in this study, Dagon's head, which is a control, and his palms, which is the hands to manipulate and articulate force, and also the palms represent inheritance. Think of that. His palms were cut off. His inheritance was cut off where? At the threshold. Which threshold were they cut off at? Better yet, 
Who guards Yahuwah's threshold? Who? What does the Hebrew language have to tell us about the guard of Yahuwah's threshold? Briefly, Dagon's threshold has nothing to do with Yosef, page 3130. Why Yosef? Yosef's name also represents the keeper of the door or the threshold. However, Yosef was a Melchizedek priest. Hmm. Could Yosef be the keeper of the threshold, being a Melchizedek priest? Think about this carefully. This will be expounded upon in future studies coming up. So who was it? Who is it that guards Yahuwah's threshold? What about Yosef? Will the Hebrew letters connect Yosef to Yahusha, the righteous threshold? Let's look at this word. Yosef, or this name, I should say, Yosef. Right here, Yosef. Yod Vav Samach Pe, Yosef. How can Yosef be the keeper for the threshold? I thought it was Yahusha. We must look at the two letter root word that assists to make up Yosef's name. Is Yosef prophesied to guard the threshold? What about this root of Yosef, these two letters, Seth, Yosef? What about these letters? What do they indicate? Here's Strong's, Seth. Note this, it's from 5605. We are going to look at that. And in, in, in its original sense of containing and a vestibule as a limit. Note that, a vestibule as a limit. Vestibule can be referenced as a door. Also a dish for holding blood or wine. Basin, bowl, cup, door, post, gate, post, and threshold. Very important. These letters, these words right here. Seth, that's the last part of Yosef's name. So what is the hidden gem in this root? Let's look at it. Have you noted the two-letter root and the root number? 5605. We're going to have a look at this. Here is the definition of 5605. Threshold, sill, and the threshold and doorkeeper. The root of Yosef's name is the doorkeeper of the threshold. This is an entrance point into the house. That's a simple statement. What house? What house is Yosef, who is a Melchizedek priest? What threshold is he going to be guarding? Whose house will he be guarding? Who will he let in? I should say, who will his character, which is going to be the guard, the Melchizedek priest, who is that character going to let in? And who is it going to cut off at the threshold at the end of time? Does this show that Yosef is a doorkeeper for the threshold? The threshold of Yahuwah? Again, H5605, this is it. This is what it all reduces to, a primitive root right here. Primitive root to stand at or guard the threshold. That's the final root of Joseph's name. What's this verse say? Psalms 8411. I choose standing at the threshold in the house of my Elohim. Interesting verse. Guard at the threshold. So which threshold should be of our highest concern? Would it not be the gate or the threshold of Revelation 2214? Blessed are those doing his commands that they may have the right to enter into the gates or through the gates into the city. 
the heavenly city of Jerusalem, which gate, which threshold is going to be blocking or allowing people to enter into the gate of the heavenly Jerusalem? Who is going to be guarding that gate? Upon finally exiting this evil earth's threshold, and that is where Dagon must remain, according to this story that we see in 1 Samuel, for he was cut off at the threshold. He was not allowed to exit his own realm. So again, I will start this again. Upon finally exiting this earth's, this evil earth's threshold where Dagon must remain, when the faithful enter Yahuwah's threshold of eternity, Yosef's Melchizedek character will greet them at the threshold. Is Yosef the Melchizedek Cohen or priest suddenly taking on a new character? Is it becoming clear who Yosef really represents? What about Yosef, sorry, what about Yosef's prophetic dream when the sun, moon, and stars bow down to him? Do you recall how resentful Yosef's brothers and father Yaakov were regarding the implication of this dream that Yosef would be a ruler over them one day? A ruler. Is that not guarding the threshold? What kind of ruler would this be? Perhaps a Melchizedek king and priest? Did the created hosts of the heavens prophetically acknowledge Yosef's future position as keeper of the threshold, as his name indicates? The Hebrew language is an incredible, credible thing. It reveals so much to us. It's absolutely astounding. I love the Hebrew language. What about this dream? Did this dream foretell of the time when Yosef became the king, that's Melech, and the priest, that's Cohen of Zadokah, or righteousness? for the kingdom of Yahuwah? Is that what this dream was all about? Or did it just want to be the first mention of the moon in scripture? I don't think so. It was telling us exactly the commission given to Yosef. Was Yosef established as doorkeeper and guard of Yahuwah's threshold in that dream? Prophetically? Could Yosef be a Melchizedek Cohen, a king of righteousness priest? What about that garment that Christianity has said was a colored coat? Is that what it was? Was that just a very simple word for that extremely important garment? Who was Yosef? Was he a Melchizedek Cohen? Have we always read these verses in the physical sense, completely bypassing the deep spiritual importance of restoration that has been prophesied in Isaiah seven times? What about John 1.45? Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him who Moshe wrote of in the Torah, and the prophets, Yahusha of Nazareth, the son of Yosef. What about that name, Yosef, the son of Yosef, Melchizedek Cohen? John 6, 42. And they said, is not this Yahusha, the son of Yosef? Would that be the keeper of the threshold? The son of Yosef, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down out of the heaven? Yahusha, the son of Yosef. Could we read Yahusha, the son of Yosef, the keeper of the threshold for Yahuwah's kingdom? 
Is that not what the Hebrew letters indicate to us? And yes, this is a question, but I'm going to say there is a seed being developed here, and I hope you can recognize it, because there is going to be a lot more coming about this in the future. Who was and who is, most importantly, who is Yosef? Because of the root meaning of the name Yosef, we find there is a huge difference between the threshold of Yosef and the threshold connected to Dagon. One is finite and one is infinite. Which one are we going to cross? Yosef connects to the one who guards the door as the doorkeeper for Yahuwah. He watches who comes across the threshold so they will not compromise the truths of Torah. He also watches, watches intently who dwells within the house that it will not become a place of desolation. Are we not to become Melchizedek priests also? What is our duty? Are we to watch the threshold of the house to see that it does not become a desolation too? What about the threshold of Dagon? Dagon connects to the asp, adder, or serpent. Can we read behind those, those words and see death? I'll start this again. Dagon connects to the asp, adder, or serpent, the one that seeks to devour, kill, and destroy. Dagon's kingdom is twisted and wicked, ever seeking to enter over the threshold of the righteous. But standing before the threshold of the Ark of the Covenant, Dagon was stripped of all power and authority. For how long? Eternity. Think of that. Remember this seed of truth for future studies. So let's move on with this story in 1 Samuel 1 5, or 1 Samuel 5, sorry. Moving forward, we learn that the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in the pagan cities brought much death, and many who did not die were struck with severe health problems. 1 Samuel 6 5. What, was, what did they speak about this problem? And you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ruin the land. And you shall give esteem to Elohim of Yisrael. It could be that he does lift his hands from you, from your mighty ones, and from your land. This is their solution. And the men did so, and they took two milk cows and hitched them to the wagon and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of Yahuwah on the wagon and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight for the way to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway. What were they doing? They were bellowing as they went and did not turn aside right or left what about those two witnesses and the princes of the philistines went after them to the border of beth shemesh so what were they doing when those two cows came bellowing into the land carrying the ark of the covenant what were they doing it was harvest time and they of beth shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the wagon came into the field of Yehoshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. And there was a great stone. So they split the wood of the wagon and offered the cows as a burnt offering to Yahuwah. Was it not war that began this troublesome time? Note carefully, when the bovine pulling the Ark of the Covenant arrived in Yisrael, the people were harvesting their wheat. A very pertinent question right here. How long was the Ark of the Covenant in the hands of the Philistines? And the Ark of Yahuwah 
was in the field of the Philistines for seven months. Seven months. Does that ring a bell? The seventh month? Can we see this seventh month harvest decimates the 99 cycle Omer count? Yes, indeed it does. When did armies go out to war? Second Chronicles 24, 23. And it came to be at the turn of the year. There's that Tekufa again, the turn of the year. That the army of Aram came up against him. And they came into Yehuda and Jerusalem and destroyed all the rulers of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the sovereign of Damasek. The time for war. Second Samuel 11, 1. And it came to be at the turn of the year, at the time sovereigns go out to battle, that Dawid sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But Dawid remained at Jerusalem. What about that word, Teshuva? That's where we read turn of the year in English. What about that word? Isn't that to turn around, to turn back? What about return to what? Teshuvah. Return to the start of the new year. Teshuva and Tekuva go hand in hand. Teshuva complements Tekuva one sorry. Teshuva complements Tekuva 100%. The turn of the year, the Tekufa, is the time that sovereigns went out to battle. Is that not a bib? Tabernacles, Sukkot, the time for dwelling. The recorded time for war was at the beginning of the year, a bib. The Philistines had captured the ark during a war. The ark was in the possession of the Philistines for seven months. Upon the miracle of the ark returning to Israel, the people were then doing what? They were harvesting wheat. It is brutally clear the two milk cows were acting against their natural instinct, pressing forward away from their young calves to bring the ark into Israel. The two-legged, sorry, sorry, the two Four-legged witnesses voiced their concern by bellowing all the way along the journey. They were announcing the arrival of the presence of Yahuwah in the land of Yisrael. What are the witnesses going to be doing at the end time? Will not the witnesses be going against their natural desire? Will not they be doing what they determine as a top priority, they will be bellowing the gospel plan of salvation at anybody who will be understanding and listening at the end of time. They will be doing exactly as these cows were doing. They will be announcing the arrival of the presence of Yahuwah in the land of Israel for anybody that is willing to listen. The two witnesses. And what about tabernacles? The time for dwelling. Is that not Sukkot? Was Yahuwah establishing his reconnection with Yisrael once again? What does the festival of booths mean? Here we see the, the Hebrew word Sukkot right here. Festival of booths. Sukkot. What is the meaning? Let's go to the two-letter root word, Samach Kaf. And we find this in the Hebrew lexicon by John Parkhurst from 1762. What does festival of booths mean? How about a tabernacle, a place to dwell? It's mentioned as a parallel to the house of Elohim, a pavilion. A booth, a bower, a tabernacle, covert, little temporary booths or huts are still usually erected in the Eastern Garden for the sake of watching them. Slight 
and temporary booths made from the boughs of trees. Yes, a suka is a temporary dwelling, a place to be for a time. Is it possible that Yahuwah had decided the time of Yisrael's reflection on their mistake was enough? And that Yahuwah wanted to reestablish his dwelling at the time of tabernacles once again in the land of Yisrael? So what was their mistake? Was it placing trust and power upon a man-made identity? Yes, Yahuwah had commanded the ark to be constructed. Yet the Israelites forgot that it was Yahuwah himself that authorized power and victory over pagan powers, and not an article constructed by man. The ark construct in and of itself contained no power or authority, as was presumed by Yisrael. Yahuwah supplies that victory, not the ark. Is this testimony demonstrating a pattern? Will Yahushua return once again for Yisrael at Tabernacles or Sukkot? We're going into the next section of this study. The next few slides have internet information from www.sabbathcovenant.com as copied from the link below. There is some pertinent information on the topic just covered, and I need to thank Johnny and Joan for bringing this to my attention. Very pertinent information coming up here. Very, very pertinent. From Dagon to the dragon. Yes, that is what you read. The word dragon comes from the word Dagon, one of, if not the oldest pagan gods dating back to Nimrod. Dagon evolved over time and cultures into the dragon. Where do we read about the dragon? I hope revelation comes to mind. Here we see Dagon, the fish god, comes into Neptune or Poseidon, who carries a trident. That comes into Satan or Leviathan. Notice the fish tail here. And Tanin. Please note this name. Tanin. We're going to look at that. Tanin. Comes into the dragon and seraph. Is, if anybody knows about this five star here, this is Ha Satan, the goat of Ha Satan. This is the aerial view layout of Washington, D.C. government areas, an aerial view all laid out according to the goat of Ha Satan. Look down here, here is Dagon, again, Neptune or Poseidon. Man creates everything in his own image. And here is the dragon. What about Revelation? Dagon is where the word dragon came from. When a nation conquered another nation, they would take their gods and incorporate them into their belief system. Semiramis, or Queen of Babylon, became Isis, who became Ishtar, or Easter who became Venus, who became Aphrodite. And notice this next bit of words. Finally, Mary. Yes, you read that correctly. Semiramis, down through the ages, has finally come down to what we know as Mary. In the same way, Nimrod, king of Babylon, became Dagon, the sea serpent, then the dragon, then Neptune, then Poseidon, then Zeus, and finally Satan. The reason Neptune carried the trident is the same reason you see Satan with the pitchfork. The trident was the article from the Jewish tabernacle for tuning the, sorry, for turn, turning the sacrifice. Maybe I'll ask Charlene to read the next slide for me. 
But here's the word I asked you to take note of, 8577, tanin, from 8565, tan. The tanim, the great sea monster, we read about that in Genesis 121, was created on the fifth day when Yahusha created the fishes and the birds. The association to the goat is also in scripture as well as in satanic worship. The goatfish, Capricorn, was also a direct association to Satan, as well as the Hydra, the Septa, which is a sea monster, and the serpent. As I, the author, this is in the quote, demonstrated in the second book in this series, The Mystery Religion of Babylon, Nimrod was the first false messiah ruling over the first attempt at a world government. World government. What is happening today? Beginning with Nimrod in Babylon, mankind began to worship Leviathan, the sea serpent. They called Dagon, who later was known as the dragon. Here's some interesting verses. Job 41, 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Verse 5. In that day, Yahuwah, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. And he shall slay the dragon, that's the word, Tanim in Hebrew, he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And verse 7, canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Fish spears. There's an interesting connection, isn't it? Okay, go ahead, Charlene, please. Yes. And this slide talks a little bit more about the dragon in the sea or Dagon, the fish god called Leviathan in scripture was worshipped by those in ancient Babylon and associated with Nimrod, the first high priest of Dagon. Worship of Dagon was passed down <clears throat> after Yahuwah confused the languages and scattered humanity across the globe. It was this religion that was prevalent and continued at the time of Rome destroying Jerusalem. It was this religion of Dagon that permeated the high priestly ranks of paganism and was the foundation of the Christian church, which even today continues to wear the priestly garments of Dagon. Continuing on, the etymology of the name S-A-T-A-N is directly connected to Leviathan. Satan and Leviathan both are derived from the word tanim, that sea creature, which is plural. The singular of tanim is tan. Satan and Leviathan are simply later versions of the tanim god Dagon, later known as the dragon. It is Dagon, the dragon, that is the spiritual source behind the Christian churches, which are based in Rome. And that means any Sunday, Christmas, Easter, Trinity, and Jesus Church. The Pope and the priesthood of the Catholic Church is the high priest and priests of Dagon, the dragon, are in disguise. And as you can see up there in that black and white picture, the author is saying it's just not a very good disguise, actually, is it? But you can see that there's many, many similarities, and you can see where the roots are for Dagon, how they have come down through Christianity. Thank you, Charlene. This slide is so incredibly powerful. It should be read a few times. <laughs> it has so much interesting information that we need to ingest and digest and realize and understand well. The priests of Dagon, even to this day, wear the fish hat and dictate Christian theology worldwide, including Protestant theology 
from the city of Rome. Every fundamental doctrine of the Christian church, such as Sunday worship, Christmas, Easter, the Trinity, the abolishment of the law or the Torah, pagan holidays, etc., were all papal edicts not found in Scripture. Let that sink in. They violate clear, explicit commands in Scripture. Rome is actually called Babylon in the Bible because it embodied the same mystery religion of Babylon. 1 Peter 5.13 The church that is at Babylon, speaking of the church in Rome, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Once we fully understand which, what Christianity actually is, what it is based on, and where it came from, then we can begin to understand why Christianity abolished the law of Yahuwah, abolished his Sabbath day, and changed the sacrifice of the Passover lamb to the Easter pig. Every one of the above moves, not commanded by Yahuwah, were made by the Pope of Rome, the high priest of Dagon, the dragon. What about that name, dragon, revelation? Should we be paying more attention? The mitre hat, the priests of Dagon were known by their mitre hat, which resembled an open mouth of a fish. An open mouth, what does an open mouth do but devour? Continuing, the same exact hat is worn even today by the Pope as well as cardinals and bishops. All priests of Dagon and the religion that surrounds them, even to this day, is identical to that born in Babylon. As the pagan religion of Babylon was forced upon humanity by the Roman Emperor Constantine, the pagan aspects of worshipping Dagon, the fish god, was toned down as to not offend other religions, as each pagan religion was literally assimilated into the universal church of Rome through the process of syncretism. Syncretism is the blending of pagan religion with the worship of Yahuwah. It is an abomination to Yahuwah. An abomination, it does not get any stronger than that. Not only are the priests of Dagon found wearing the mitre hat, but also the Pope and bishops of Rome are frequently found wearing this mitre hat. This clergy system forms a pagan priest class not defined in the word of Yahuwah, but rather clearly defined in ancient Babylon. And it is from this false class of priests we get every doctrine of the Christian church. We see the priest of Dagon on the ancient wall drawing in every culture, even as far back as the Sumerians when the Pope then served the Nephilim rulers. There is nothing in the word of Yahuwah or in the historical record indicating that the Messiah Yahusha ever wore such a hat or created such a priestly high class of royalty. There are strong evidences that Nimrod was, sorry, that Dagon was Nimrod. All scholars agree that the name and worship of Dagon were imported from Babylonia. Note the reference below, the two Babylons by Hislop. In their veneration and worship of Dagon, the high priest of paganism would actually put on a garment that had been created from a huge fish. Whew. The head of the fish formed a mitre above that of the old man, while its scaly, fan-like tail fell as a cloak behind, leaving the human limbs and feet exposed. Note that source. The most prominent form of worship in Babylon was dedicated to Dagon, later known as 
it's this or the fish. There's that word, it's this. We're going to look at that. In Chaldean times, the head of the church was the representative of Dagon. He was considered to be infallible and was addressed as your holiness. Have you heard that today? Have you seen that written in the media today? Where did it come from? Nations subdued by Babylon had to kiss the ring. We've heard of that in Rome. And slipper of the Babylonian god king. The same powers and the same titles are claimed to this day by the Dalai Lama of Buddhism and the Pope. <clears throat> Moreover, the vestments of paganism, the fish mitre, and robes of the priests of Dagon are worn by the Catholic bishops and cardinals and popes. Ixis, symbol of the phi, and I hope I've said that correctly. Dagon, fish worship, is the source of the Christian symbol of the fish. How many times have you have been going about your duties around town? Do you see that symbol stuck to the back bumper or back window of cars and thought, oh, there's a worshiper or there's a person who is promoting the words of the Bible? How many times have you seen that symbol? Do we need to correct our thoughts on that symbol? What does it actually represent? Actually, it can be traced back to fish worship of Dagon and the zodiac sign of Pisces. Are we understanding now that that fish was cut off at the threshold before it even was able to enter eternity? Cut off. Its inheritance was terminated. We are told it is because some of the disciples were fishermen, or that Yahushua would make us fishers of men, among other excuses. The truth is that it is nowhere defined in scripture, but yet, the real source of the Christian fish symbol is that of Dagon fish worship, just like the mitre hat. Friends, this is syncretism in its purest form. It does not get any clearer. This is a difficult sentence to read. Is Christianity just a nice word for paganism? It's becoming clear. According to Egyptian mythology, when the judges found Osiris, or Nimrod, guilty of corrupting the religion of Adam and cut up his body, they threw the parts into the Nile. It was said that a fish ate one of these chunks and became transformed. Later, Isis, and that would be Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, was fishing along the riverbank when she fished up a half man, half fish. This sea creature was Dagon, the reincarnated Nimrod. And Dagon is the representation of Nimrod of ancient Babylon, resurrecting out of the ocean depths as a half man, half fish. Wow. Dagon is the diminutive of Dag and signifies fish. The Babylonians believed that a being, part man and part fish, emerged from the Erythraean Sea and appeared in Babylonia in the early days of its history. Representations of this fish god have been found among the sculptures of Nineveh. The Philistine Dagon was of a similar character. This also explains the symbol for Christianity. The fish, the itchthis, or sorry, the itchthis, which is Dagon, definition of itchthik, of pertaining to or characteristic of fishes, the fish world in all its orders. 
That's from the Oxford English Dictionary. So when you see this fish, this symbol, the it's this, what does it mean? When you see this symbol, <clears throat> we need to relate this back to Dagon, because that is what it's worshiping. That is the open mouth that is taking your worship back to paganism. The worship of Dagon also affected people's eating habits. <clears throat> now, the mystery of why the Catholics abstain from eating fish on all days except Fridays comes into focus. This restriction of eating fish is not found in Scripture. And whether they realize it or not, they are practicing the ancient pagan rite of worshiping Dagon. The Catholic Encyclopedia even admits such abominations of the so-called church. As to the ritual of his worship, we only know from ancient writers that, for religious reasons, most of the Syrian peoples abstained from eating fish a practice that one is naturally inclined to connect to the worship of a fish god. That is taken directly from the Catholic Encyclopedia. So is this why we see ads like this for Christian Lent? Is that word Christian actually real, applicable? Christian Lent? To whom does it give homage and what about this ad time for god and cod it's got a nice ring to it if you don't know where it came from fish fry who was actually fried at the threshold was it not dagon was not his future and inheritance cooked at the threshold how about this fish fry? Every Friday during Lent, noon until 7, at the church hall, a fish fry. Is this Dagon's open fish mouth, seeking whom it may devour? Isn't that what we read in Revelation? Seeking whom he may devour? Which threshold is going to stop us? And which threshold will Yosef be allowing people through? Also, remember, the word of Yahuwah, we are forgiven, or so, sorry, we are forbidden to have any graven images, including that of a fish, or a cross, it is commanded to have no graven images at all of any kind, period. Yahuwah forbid such idols because over time, we would eventually forget their true origins and buy into lies that they are somehow symbolic of Yahusha. With that, let us unravel the mystery that lies behind the false religion called today Christianity. Who created it? What did they believe? And what is its goal? So wrapping up here in conclusion, number one, this scripture testimony of Dagon in today's study was based on the clear evidence that Yahuwah's day start is at Boker and dawn, not at sunset. That's where this study started. It was just to be a nice little story to reveal the sunset theory that is so disastrous and deceptive. But yet, it has a lot more to it. Number two. However, the history of the name of Dagon, its related threshold, and all that has been handed down through the ages should encourage many to look further and deeper into other messages found within this testimony. There is only one true Messiah and priest. And this is the end of today's study. I hope you have been blessed. If you have enjoyed this study today, please join us live each week 
and sign up with Covenant Calendar Club for the Friday and Shabbat Zoom meetings, including this live discussion today. And there's our website address down there at studythecalendar.com. May Yahuwah assist your desire to understand and also your decision to process any new information. And please send your questions and or responses to questions at studythecalendar.com. And I thank you for giving us your time today. Shalom and may you be blessed for eternity.